Hey guys, are you taking the SAT soon and wondering how the College Board is trying to get you? Well, if so, in this video, I'm going to go over some sneaky traps that the College Board has set for test takers so that you do not become a victim of SAT tricks. If you're wondering who I am, my name is Brooke. I've been coaching the SAT and the ACT for over a decade and a half. I've helped coach students to perfect scores on both exams. We have all of the secrets that I've shared with those students online in our online courses, the best ACT prep course ever and the best SAT prep course ever. I just had a student actually the other day on one of our online courses say that he got a perfect 36 overall on the ACT, which is awesome. We're really excited for him. If you wanna know how he did it, Go to supertutortv.com and you can check out the best ACT prep course ever and the best SAT prep course ever. We also have books for the ACT, the best ACT math books ever. Check those out on amazon.com. If you already have them and love them, leave us some love and leave us a review on there. We totally appreciate it. You can also subscribe to our email list. It's totally free. supertutortv.com slash subscribe and we'll keep you in the know of new YouTube videos we have out, any announcements we have, any deals we might have going on. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at supertutortv. Go find us there, follow us and keep in the know. Sneaky traps. We're gonna go through one in each section of the multiple choice, math. Sneaky trap, graphs. Okay, this was totally on the October 2019 SAT. I've seen it on a couple of other exams recently too. Basically, the college board will use a graph that is not scaled in a way that is just one to one. So let's talk about the normal Cartesian plane. Our normal Cartesian plane, right? And this is gonna be sloppy because I'm hand drawing it, but bear with me and my beautiful drafting skills. A normal Cartesian plane, right? We have little tick marks and on the SAT, it will be grid lines and each tick mark equals one. So one, two, three, four, dot, 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 right? One, two, three, four. And if I have a point say here and the college board wants to know what is the slope of this line, right? A lot of you, when it's a graph, will just count the boxes and you will go, oh, Rise over run, rise is one, two, three, that's three. Over run is one, that's beautiful. So my slope is three, yay. <laughs> but here's what the College Board might do to you. The College Board doesn't do one, two, three, four, five. Nah, that would be too easy. It does two, four, six, eight. And sometimes it won't even do two, four, six, eight over here. It might do one, two, three, four, five. It might do 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. There's all sorts of tricks it will pull on you. But know that these scales are not always the same and it can totally screw you over and make your mind dizzy and confused. So here, the slope of this line is not three. One, two, three up, yes, because this is a three. But guess how many over I am? Two. So my slope is actually three over two. So do not count the boxes. Make sure that you're very attentive to detail. And that's really the bigger lesson is be attentive to detail. I've also seen graphs and charts on the SAT where they might have numbers and this is like 20, 40, 60, and then they'll be in fine print over here in thousands. And guess what? This is a total game changer. And the answer choices in the answers below might be, you know, 60,000. And you guys get confused because you saw the 60, right? So always read all your details. Always be really careful on graphs and charts. Get in there and make sure you read the detail Orient yourself to what's going on and do not just look at the boxes. Do not just count the boxes. Do not just look at the ratio of this to this size wise. If you have two charts, right, that chart something, and then this is another chart that charts something, don't assume the scales are the same, right? If you have two charts you're comparing and you're trying to get data across them, be super careful here and you're going to be in better shape and you're not going to make that kind of an error. Number two, second stinky trap. We're gonna go to reading. The specifics are beautiful but it's not the right answer. And this is the sneaky trap is details. Details are dangerous is my next point, okay? And why are details dangerous? Details are dangerous because oftentimes our human minds, and the College Board must know this, our human minds can absorb details so much more quickly and efficiently than abstract terms. Our brains are just not wired to understand abstraction quickly but they are wired to understand details quickly. And so our natural bias is toward details and answer choices and not toward the abstracts. Oftentimes we read over the abstracts and we don't have time to push those into understanding or comprehension and we gravitate toward the details. And when we do that, 
We might favor answer choices that have details that we like or more detail, but that doesn't make the answer choice better because there might be an abstract word that makes it wrong. And that's just the pattern our brains typically adhere to when we're quickly reviewing information. But it creates this trap that a lot of students fall into. And so I want you guys to be able to avoid this trap. And so let's get into a question. I'm going to show you kind of how this works. So this example is actually from an example, PSAT 8.9. But let's be honest, it's all the same wheelhouse. Whether it's a PSAT 8.9, it's a PSAT 10, or an SAT, it's all the same dirty tricks the College Board is playing on you guys. It's the same stuff, just made harder on the regular SAT with some harder math problems, right? Uh, and some harder reading passages. Based on the passage, ellipse, not sure if I pronounce that right, perspective on studying the blue holes is that it is. So first, before we answer this, as you guys know, I always like to go back to the passage first. Maybe you don't know. If you're not in our course, you might not know. I read the question. I always try to find the perfect answer before I look down. So I'm going to do that first. It's really incredible to be swimming down a passage that no one has ever been in before to experience that thrill of discovery, said blah, blah, blah. At the bottom of a cave, there's no telling what might be around the next corner. So this is like, wow, there's so many mysteries. It's so exciting. I'm in the cave and I'm going to see like so many cool things, right? And if you read the title here, it's like strange life found in underwater caves. So we know this is like he's finding strange life and he's really, you know, into it. And this is cool and it's unknown. And here's what happens when I have students approach this. A lot of times you guys challenging to understand why water in the caves has such unique properties. Hmm. This is a specific that seems kind of true. Perplexing to find so many strange life forms in unexpected places. This is a detail that's definitely there that like we're going into this cave and nobody knows it's going to be around the next corner because no one's been there before, right? And strange life forms, heck, that's like in the title of the thing. And so that's cool. This probably could be kind of inferred. And then we have dangerous to venture into unexplored territories. Well, we know that this is like you never know what's going to be around the corner. It's this exciting place where I've never been before. This is totally dead on to what he's talking about. And then we have exciting to explore the unknown. This one is simpler, but unknown, as I would argue, is a little bit more vague. It's a little bit more abstract. And so sometimes our brains like to wrap themselves around things that are more specific. And this is how our brains gravitate. And, and sometimes that leads people to pick B, for example, because we have the strange life forms that was in the title. I remember that. This unexpected places, that's really what he's talking about. I also have the unexplored territories, but dangerous, eh, I don't think he's like, it's dangerous. He's like happy about it. So perplexed isn't so negative. Maybe that's right, right? And I get a lot of people picking B. But B's not right. D is right. And D is right because it's more on vibe. Exciting is totally this guy, right? You saw how I read it with emotion and with voice. Emotion's so important on the SAT. I like to call it vibe. Exciting to explore the unknown. That, when I read it as a whole, is totally on vibe with what this guy was saying up there. But when I say perplexing to find so many strange life forms in unexpected places, these two specifics are fine for the passage, but this perplexing is kind of problematic because is this guy scratching his head? No, he's just jazzed and excited and like, woohoo, so awesome right? You hear me read that. I was a little dramatic when I read it, but that's the point. I'm dramatic in my head when I read these. And so you can see how these, these specifics can anchor you and you can think that they kind of sound right and they're not right. This is what's right. And so you want to be careful. Oftentimes vague answers are right on the SAT. So do not be anchored by specifics just because your brain processes them faster. This is akin to cherry picking, which I talk about in our reading tips video. So if you want more reading tips, definitely check out that video and I'll talk more about cherry picking. And that's another way that this manifests, this idea. But details are dangerous. Beware. Sneaky trap. Okay, next one. We're going to go sneaky trap. Number three is writing in language. And this one is just a general note. And that is one line up, one line down isn't enough. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes there are going to be questions, say like short transition questions on the writing and language section where you have to pick which little short transition word is the best one. Is it although? Is it furthermore? Right? Which word is right? And oftentimes the strategy students take when they have this is they read the sentence before it and they read the sentence there and they pick one. That works sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't. And this is how the college board really gets you. And this is their sneaky trap. Oftentimes, if you read one line up and one line down, there will be like a trick answer that talks about the things that are one line up and one line down, but that don't really encompass the whole main idea that you need to transition to or the entire paragraph you need to transition to. It just transitions to that next sentence. But what it focuses on in that next sentence is not actually what the paragraph wants you to focus on if you looked at a bigger context. 
So my best advice is do not just read a one line up and one line down whenever you have a transition, whenever you have like, oh, does this sentence go here? Should I keep this? Should I delete this? Sentence placement, for example. Don't just go through in the first place you place it if you read one sentence above and then into that sentence be done. Because sometimes you create damage where you don't know when you're placing a sentence. There's all sorts of things that can get you in trouble. So my advice is zoom out and make sure you have a handle on everything going on. Because if you're too far zoomed in, that is a sneaky trap of the new SAT. This was not a trap on the old SAT. On the old SAT, if you read one line up and one line down, you were almost always totally fine. And on the new SAT, the gig is up and it doesn't work anymore. And in fact, sometimes it will completely mislead you and there will be a trick answer that they will put in there. So be wary, beware, don't fall for the trap. I hope you guys found this helpful. If so, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet. And go check out supertutortv.com to see more of what we do. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll see you guys next time.